He built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. So you have this response of worship, of being uh, moved by how God has been at work in his life. So in verse 9, Abraham journeyed on, continuing toward the Negev. And so he's down in the desert region. And in verse 10, we see that here's the problem. There's a famine. Now, how many times have you had this sense that God was at work in your life in a certain way, that He had given you a direction and a promise, and all of a sudden, things weren't working out the way you would expect? How can this situation be anything good to do with what God has shown me He wants to do in my life and in my family or whatever it might be? And so now there's a famine in the land. Kind of messes up the promise a little bit, doesn't it? So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there. What's missing in that state? Does it say Abram cried out to God? Asked God what to do about the famine? Did it say that he sought the direction of the Lord or that the Lord spoke to him? Does the scripture say anywhere... God told him to go to Egypt. No. Now here's our problem. That is a normal response to a situation. We don't have food. They have it somewhere else. We have money. I'm going there. And by the way, Abram was quite well. And so off they go to Egypt where the famine was severe in the land. So he would say, oh, I thought if I follow the Lord, everything will work out. So maybe God needs some help. You know, he's going to fulfill his promise and everything. But I need to help him a little bit. Let me see how we can fix this situation uh, and, and get God some help. Well, in verse 11, it came about. He came near to Egypt. He gets a little scheme going in his head. See, he's got this little problem. He likes breathing. And he's afraid when he gets to Egypt, there's one particular problem that might end his ability to breathe. He says to his wife, Sarah, See now, I know that you're a beautiful woman. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. And they will kill me. But they will let you live. Now, he's got a fear, right? He's made a decision to go to Egypt. We don't see any direction from the Lord to do that. And now he's on the way. He thinks he's got a plan. And he's got this little fear. And so now he is going to cry out to God. Sarah, let's pray. You and I will pray that we will be safe in Egypt. Is that how that goes? Well, let's look at verse 13. Please say that you are my sister. So that it may go well with me because of you. And that I may live on account of you. Now, any of you recognize Pinocchio there? He's kind of missing his hat, but there he is. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, is that Abram could say, she's my half-sister. Because in fact, he was married to his half-sister. And so... We talked about the genetics of that at the time not being a problem, and yet ultimately God would give the direction on how close the family relations should be. So here's the plan, and it's almost the truth. The best deception is usually at least partially true. So Sarah is Abram's half-sister, and so now Abram has to help God work this situation out by devising a deception. Because obviously God can't do it without Abram's deception. So here we are struggling with this reality. Well, you would think his little plan is probably not going to work out real good, right? Well, we get to verse 14. And the passage tells us that came about when Abram came into Egypt. The Egyptians saw the woman was very beautiful. Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. 
Therefore, he treated Abram well for her sake and gave him sheep and oxen and donkeys and male and female servants and female donkeys and camels. I don't know why we had to separate the male and female donkeys in two different places. It's interesting how God puts that in the Word. And camels. Alright. So, it kind of went good. Because now he's richer than he was. But now his wife lives down the street at Pharaoh's house. Now what? How many times do we as believers and followers of Jesus have to, to go through something where we decide to help God and we find ourselves in a jam. Well, it kind of worked out good. You know, we we had more money or we were living in a better place or, or, or you know, we got away from this one problem. But in the process of whatever we did, there's a whole new situation. A whole new list of things that can and have gone wrong. Well, as you look at the next part of the passage, you begin to see how God is going to use the circumstances to correct in this. But the Lord struck Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram. When you make a plan that God did not make, God is not obligated to let you go with it. He's not. His obligation, because of His love for us, is to intervene in our situation to teach us not to do those kinds of things and to learn how to walk with Him in obedience because that's the best place to be. Then Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? I don't know how he knows. How God let him know what was going on. Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say, She is my sister. So that I took her for my wife. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Well, that is not exactly... The way we would want that to turn out. And so, we talk about what we gain and what we lose when we do the things that, uh, actually that's not supposed to be there. You can move on. Thank you. I didn't move that one out. When Abraham temporarily gained the favor of failure, because of his deception. What did he lose? He had the opportunity to present the one true God to another group of the descendants of Ham. And to show how God had blessed him and worked in his life and situation. And instead of doing that, now because of his sin, he is being corrected by the unbelievers. Right? We can lose our witness out there in the world by doing what the world does. Rather than doing the things that God would have us do. And we will be oftentimes corrected by people in that world, in the sinful world. Now folks, we have to understand and I know we're in the United States and we often don't see it this way. But the world is not being run by saved people. This world that you live in today is predominantly unbelieving. They are not followers of Jesus Christ. And so the world as we know it today is operating in the system of the prince of the power of the air. It's a fallen world and the devil is at work everywhere in it. And most all of the people in places of prominence and leadership, uh, if you look at the world overall, they're not believers. And so our witness to those people is crucial. That we would be the kind of folks 
that was set that kind of example. Now, here's Pharaoh's response. It's not just take your wife and leave, is it? Yes, just take your wife and leave my country. They escorted him away with his wife and all that belonged. So what did he lose? Well, that doesn't say suddenly the famine is gone, does it? And so he had as an ally for a short period of time one of the most powerful men on the face of the earth in his lifetime. And he destroyed that relationship with that person by deceiving them in order to help God take care of them. We have got to stop helping God and getting in His way. Now, when God wants us to do something, He always tells us, right? How many of you have been in experiencing God? You can raise hands, okay. Does God let you know when He has something He wants you to do? Well, a whole bunch of the things He wants us to do are already right here, right? So we know what they are. And then very specifically, there are times when God asks us to do one of these things at a specific time or place. And so God doesn't need for us to come up with things or ways. And guys, it's Father. Uh, this is a challenge that we have to do to restrain ourselves from simply acting out on what we think we know should, we should do as men. As opposed to our children seeing us lift up our concerns and our needs to a God who loves us more than anyone. And our families need to see that. And I encourage you not to give up on that process. I, I've struggled. Every man here has struggled. But don't give up on the process because our children need to see that when we struggle, we don't give up on God. But that we turn to God in the times of struggle and we do deal with the sin in our life. And they have that example as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is a connector piece for this message today. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. You think you're doing pretty good? Was Abram doing pretty good? Absolutely. He was in the land. He left Haran. He was building altars to God and, and receiving promises that God actually, I don't know, when's the last time God just visibly showed up to you? That, that hasn't happened to me, but it happened for Abraham. So yeah, he was doing great. But we have to know that we have an enemy. And so we need to be careful that him who thinks he stands, I'm doing good. Take heed that he does not fall. How we do that? Well, the scripture is always going to be very specific. Notice that it says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. To be self-serving, to act from his own uh, self-will, whatever it might be. These are all temptations that we all face. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're in. Or hopefully you're aware of that. That you know that God has a pressure valve in your life situation. He knows temptation is coming. But He's not going to allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Most people take this passage and they say, that's right. He won't let me get more miserable or sick. Well, I don't know that this passage is particularly focused on that. I think it has to do with sin temptations in our life, that we deal with lust, that we deal with self-serving attitudes, that we deal with entitlement, that we deal with all these kinds of things. Now this is not to say that God won't allow you to be tempted to give up because of them. And that's a temptation as well. But it's a bigger picture than physical issues. It goes to the very heart of who we are. God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. So if God is true and His Word is true, you have never faced a temptation that God does, did not know you would be able to handle in His power and in His strength. So what does He do? He knows the temptation is coming. 
what does he do? Very specifically, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape also. That is the challenge, is it not, guys? But for all of us today, when the temptation comes to gossip, when the temptation comes to lie, when the temptation comes for whatever, to instead of going through with the sin, to allow it to, to uh, take root and to grow, that we would look for the way out. How has God provided me in this situation the way out? Did Abram do that? Did he look for God's way out when there was a famine? Even though God had made a promise, did he look for the way out? And that was how God would have been able to bless him in that situation. The God that walked with him. The God that revealed himself to him. The God that provided for his needs. The God that promised him great. So we have to remember this God that we have who is so gracious and loving and desires to have fellowship with us. That he provides a way of escape. So that you and I will be able to endure it. So just a little deception. Can you think about a few points? How do we get in trouble? How have I, how have you, how have we gotten in trouble in the past? Maybe a statement that we wouldn't have never said with our mouth. But it, went, it happened in our mind and our heart. I believe we ought to obey the word of God. Except. Except in this situation, whatever I'm facing, it's just not practical to do that. I might lose my job. Uh, nobody's going to believe me. Uh, it's not the best way to go about this. I, so I'm just going to work another, another path. I'm going to work in deception or tell a lie or do whatever. How about, I believe we should have loving church discipline, just like Jesus taught in Matthew 18. Except, 